just before we launch into this brand new episode, a little bird told me that you should make a special note of the last two weekends in May in 2021. Just uh, bear that in mind when you listen to the rest of the episode. I'm Grant Williams, and this is The Bird Emergency. It's my pleasure now to speak with Dr. Claire Hawkins, the Citizen Science Coordinator, the Honorary Research Associate, University of Tasmania Honorary Research Associate, Citizen Science Coordinator at the Bookend Trust. Claire describes herself as a conservation biologist. Now, I like the sound of that and takes special delight in uh, studying threatened species. But those of you who follow me on Twitter will no doubt have seen Claire on Twitter talking about her, um, is it your pet project, Where Where Wedgie? It's mostly my life at the moment, actually, Grant. <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for coming on to the bird emergency, Claire. Tell us what your what's your role? What what's the citizen science coordinator at the Book End Trust? What what do you what do you do? <laughs> well, uh, I figured that citizen science was a good idea in around 2017. Uh, well, 2015, I did a Churchill Fellowship on citizen science. And so that gave me some ideas about what I was thinking about, where I might take it. And one of the first things uh, the Bookend Trust did was uh, start some bio blitzes, which we called Extinction Matters bio blitzes. I hope that's a phrase that's close to your heart. A common thing with bio blitzes is to get people to realise the kind of threatened species and other things that they just didn't expect to be in their backyard. So our bio blitzes are in um, typically council reserves, and we've done four of them now. And once we'd just sort of con- connected with people a bit and shown people who perhaps weren't into this sort of thing before some of their power, uh, we kicked off with Nature Trackers as a program to start monitoring threatened species in general. Uh, and the first project there was focusing on threatened species, uh, threatened birds, uh, particularly wedge-tailed eagles, which are threatened in Tasmania, all raptors in Tasmania, um, and also uh, the white cockies and corellas, the sulphur-crested cockatoo and the two corellas for extra. We, we love them to death, but um, I wasn't aware that they were threatened in Tasmania. In fact, uh, the times I've been to Tasmania, I'd never seen a big white flying bird unless it was a pelican, I think. <laughs> no, they're not at all threatened. Uh, but, well, for one thing, we wanted to be sure that a decent number of people got to see something while they were out there looking for threatened species. We can talk about that a lot more, this challenge that you send people out to look for these threatened species. And there's a very good chance you won't actually see anything and you end up feeling a bit sad about that. Um, but the other thing, well, two other things. First off, we wanted people to look really hard at the white birds, just in case they were grey goshawks, which in Tasmania are always white. And also there is a perception that the the two corellas um, and the soft-crested cockatoo are increasing across Tasmania. It's really confusing because they move around so much, so you can feel completely overwhelmed by them when in fact it's just one group that keep arriving in different places. So we wanted to get a better handle on, on what, what the numbers were looking like and whether they truly were increasing. Tell me about the Bookend Trust. The Bookend Trust is a not-for-profit uh, which focuses on environmental education. Uh, so I kind of went up to them going, I'm busting to do this citizen science stuff and you have a whole lot of skills that I know nothing about to do with education and uh, science communication. Uh, and it's been, it's been a wonderful thing to bring the two together, to bring this environmental education Uh, A wonderful uh, example is the expedition class. That's been something that's been going on for a while that Bookend Trust does, where they have uh, scientists and adventurers going to to schools. And then we've had, uh, for quite some years, we've had Andrew Hughes, who is an adventurer. He calls it adventure learning. He inspires some schools with what he's going to do. And then he goes off for a month and blogs and latterly has been video presenting little videos every single day from some crazy place, be it... Uh, on a desert island or um, canoeing. There was one time when he actually kayaked from Hobart up to the Tiwi Islands, all very gripping and engaging to children. And so you can get in an awful lot of exciting, like 
curriculum based uh, messages that way. Also, the Book End Trust has produced an amazing documentary size movie called 16 Legs, which is all about Tasmania's incredible huge cave spiders. It's won loads of awards and is quite a thing. <laughs> How big's a Tasmanian cave spider? Well, we like to say that they're the size of a dinner plate. Okay, that's some. Um, that's sizable. They can easily cover your face and be the stuff of nightmares when you wake up. Yeah, if if, if you're concerned, but uh, they're also yeah beautiful and stunning and fascinating. They have a really interesting romantic story in this documentary. Are they docile and they're not bird hunters? Oh, they're not. No, they're not. Like, well, I don't think they're scary. Not not for any sensible reason. Of course, lots of people find spiders a little bit disconcerting, but no, one would have no reason to fear them. Okay, fabulous. Now, I've become more aware of the uh, amount of citizen science projects that are going on probably just in the last sort of six months, nine months, and a lot of them appear to be really well-resourced and really active, and a lot of them look like they're great ideas, but they're they're wholly reliant on the goodwill of a couple of, of volunteers. What I'd like to ask you, because you're involved in, in many projects, how often are they really successful in either raising awareness or collecting really important and useful data from a conservation point of view? I don't know that I can give you chapter and verse on the awareness thing. That's something that we have a, a social science arm to nature trackers. So it's something I hope we're going to learn very much from ours. But I guess, as I mentioned, I did a Churchill Fellowship on, on citizen science and I visited a bunch of specialists in citizen science around the world, which is amazing. I went to Cornell. I went to various places in the UK, including the British Trust for Ornithology, and they can and, and it actually, even in Tasmania, before I went, uh, Reef Life Survey and the British Trust for Ornithology and Cornell can all produce you reams of papers that have come out of citizen science projects. Yeah, no, no problem there. There's, there's absolutely squillions of, uh, of information that's come out of uh, volunteer effort. Now, where Where Wedgie is going to be, I think, important for just knowing far more about wedge-tailed eagles in, in Tasmania. But before we go there, which citizen science projects are you aware of that are happening in Australia at the moment that are really significant for threatened species? And they don't have to just be birds. I just want to get the, the word out if you know about any, apart a, apart from your yabby one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of Nature Trackers. Well, I, I'm... I think Reef Life Survey is, is an amazingly well organised and run project. Uh, that's all over. That's all over Australia and I think around certain parts of the world. That's obviously a, a dive project, and and there's a lot of very keen divers uh, who are just kind of looking for th things to do with their diving. So that works super well, um, and they're often quite prepared to really spend quite a lot of time learning to identify the different species and so on and. Uh, yeah, that works brilliantly. There's also Red Map, um, another marine project that's actually also, I think it sprang out of Tassie, where fishers re record unusual species that they haven't typically seen. So one gets an idea of things like climate change and how that's affecting where species are. Yeah, I'm very aware of the Tassie ones. It's going to be hard for me. I, I mean, obviously, there's all, all of the stuff that BirdLife runs, and there are some very uh, particular projects I can't remember the proper name. You'll know it better. The, the Cocky Project. I think that seems to be going incredible. You, 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 in, you interviewed it's Tegan that's running that, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the um, uh, the Great Cocky Count. The Great Te Cocky Count. I think that sounds like it's going super well. Yeah, that's um, uh, you know a, a decade of continual uh, data collection, which has been terrific. I think. And I suppose, I mean, more casually, uh, I'm very excited about the the app iNaturalist, uh, which is a kind of general repository where you can record whatever you've seen. But I think in terms of there's quite a lot of species where it is truly useful to literally record where you've seen something, because there are some species where it's really useful to just, you know, it's got a small range and you want to know where this is. And then if you find it outside the range, that's fascinating. And in many cases, you can take a good enough photo that 
can actually identify the species from that photo. So that's just amazing. And you just don't even know the ways that those can be used in the future. It can be difficult to use these incidental records, but I think for some groups of species, it's super useful. Well, let's let's talk about uh, nature trackers more in in detail and and tell us all about where we're wedgie. <laughs> well, to give you a bit of background, I suppose, to start with, I was threatened species zoologist for the state government for quite some years. And I noticed that <laughs> I noticed that a really high proportion of my time was spent uh, worrying about Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles. They're a threatened species here and they're facing a whole pile of threats. Some of them you might relate more to corporations and, and particular activities like forestry and wind farms and development. Uh, but there's also some things that people do on an everyday basis to do with maybe disturbing breeding that they wouldn't even realise and, and um, killing them on the roadside. People don't realise these things. And it's just this huge number of different threats uh, that we have to manage around. So it was obvious to me that it would be a good idea to raise awareness of these things. And also it had been um, the sort of late 90s when uh, there'd been a formal attempt to estimate the numbers. Um, and there was just this guess that the numbers, on, on the basis of all these threats, that the numbers were declining. Uh, but nobody even knew that. Uh, and there are people who are doing um, all the sorts of things that you'd want if you were trying to get a good handle on numbers. They're, they're going to different nests and, and having a look at how productive they are. Uh, but it's a very expensive and complicated business to look at nests um, in a really accurate manner where you're sampling all sorts of different habitats and conditions and tenures and everything. So that wasn't really happening. Uh, so we just didn't have that information, were the numbers increasing or decreasing? And that's a critical bit of information if you want to know whether you're achieving good conservation outcomes. Um, and also, obviously, to motivate. Um, it costs a lot of people, a lot of money to avoid impacting on Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagles. Uh, and so it's really important to know <laughs> whether it's working, whether we're doing the right thing. So that was the motivation. Claire, before we talk more about how, how the project actually happens, what's the difference between a Tassie wedge-tail and a mainland wedge-tail? And why, I mean, is, is there different sort of habit habits and habitats that that they occur in and are they so different that they that genetic work might discover that there are different species well <laughs> i am not a geneticist there has been some genetic work uh as i understand it so far the genetics indicate that the species uh, that the subspe it is listed as a subspecies but that this might not be correct and that actually it might just be uh, a little a uh, little a race sample of yeah. of the mainland species and that it's not actually that different uh, but they certainly are very distinct they're bigger than the average mainland eagle uh, wedge-tailed eagle they really are massive and they're also super sensitive to disturbance which i think most mainland eagles aren't that sensitive uh, so there are these issues i wouldn't like to to comment too extensively on on whether the genetic work is the be all and end all but regardless we certainly would like to retain eagles in tasmania all of our carnivores pretty much are going downhill and it makes a massive difference to the whole uh, ecosystem to lose carnivores so we definitely want to keep our eagles <laughs> yeah I, I think for people who uh, certainly who aren't in australia but a lot of people in australia probably won't tie the two together but the tasmanian devil is fast becoming a very rare sight in tasmania mainly due to a disease so there's insurance populations being held on the mainland, disease-free, in an effort to preserve the species, but they can't be put back into Tasmania until the disease is either eradicated or a method of control is found. And the other... And that was my first job um, with the Tasmanian government was setting up a monitoring program to figure out if the disease truly was a problem for Tasmanian devils. 
I need a spin-off uh, podcast, I think, to talk about mammals. There's so, there's so much work that's been, um, and really interesting, critical work that's been done with, with mammals, but... Um, but that's not who we're talking. About, who we're here to talk about today. But while while we're there, you you also worked on quolls. I did, aren't they fantastic? Yeah, it's 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 I'll give you a bit of leeway to uh, to rock rock about the quoll because um, everybody loves the quoll. <laughs> yes, well, I was I was um, only able to work on them for a year. Uh, there's a, a concern that the the quolls are heavily dependent on forest, like super sensitive to forest loss. And I wanted to learn a lot more about that. But I just did it for a year. I, I had funding for a year's work. And then I was super keen to keep going with that. And then the whole devil thing kicked off. And that was where the money lay. Uh, but it certainly seemed that female calls in particular uh, were really keen to stay somewhere super stable, really well forested. Uh, the males were much more relaxed about going all over the place. Uh, but I would have I would have really liked to get a bit more into into that. Uh, but they are fantastic. And I was particularly inspired to investigate them because I did my PhD in Madagascar on the animal you can see behind me here, um, the, the fossa in Madagascar. Oh, there we um, go. And that, that's, you know, they're just quite ecologically similar. And I was kind of curious to, to explore that. But uh, I, I, I don't know if they're if they're so extraordinarily similar, but they're both incredibly wonderful animals that I really really enjoyed studying and getting to know. They're full of character. Now I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, Claire, but what what's your sense of the status of the quoll in Tasmania? Uh, well, it, yeah, there's been a few studies trying to get a better handle on that. I certainly they're certainly um, very low in number. But whether that's scary low or just stable low is is something that's a little bit hard to to say. But for sure, if something's relatively low in number, you you want to keep an eye on it. And they are really hard to monitor. That's that's another species I've got my eye on with citizen science. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that, that's enough of the mammalian chatter. Tell us about the where. What, when, and how of uh, of where where wedgie? How how did how did it begin? I, it, you you recognise the problem uh, and and the need for for some uh, reliable data, but how did you actually pull the uh, the project together and and design it? On this fellowship, I met a wonderful chap at the British Trust for Ornithology, Stuart Newson, who designed this booking map uh actually he'd actually got into bats although he's a superb birder he's um he, he's working on bats and this booking map allowed people to arrange where they were going to um put a borrowed bat box a bat recorder uh, and figure out where the bats were and it, it sort of helped people self-organize where they were going to do their surveys and i'd been really thinking you know how do we get people to to sort of spread out all over Tasmania that's that's the real challenge with citizen science is to um well with for monitoring species at least is to not have all the twitches go to the one really amazing site or all the eagle lovers go to their favorite spot and my goodness the first year we did this people really really just wanted to go to the place where they knew that there were eagles but we need to have people go to all sorts of environmental conditions uh, so that we know where the, the eagles are less common and we need them to do something fairly similar, sampling widely across Tasmania every single year. So that was the real challenge. And that that's something that I've been finding fascinating about how to achieve it. But the first thing was asking Stuart if we could basically copy his booking map, which he said, yes, it's fine. And he's been a great advisor as we've been going along and encourage people to book where they were going to do their survey. Yeah, so we, we divided up the whole of Tasmania into four kilometre by four kilometre squares. Uh, we also took a leaf out of the BioBlitz book and decided to do it all on just a few days uh, because that's very incentivizing as well as quite good scientifically to have it all happening uh, at once. Um, same conditions and we might be able to reduce the amount of uh, double counting of the same eagle lots and lots of times. So how many how many days does it occur? Um, just go, go through the, the, the methodology or the procedure a little bit. It's evolved a bit. 
But what we've got now, we tweaked it a bit. The first year, we just proved that it could work um, and that people were up for it, which is amazing. Um, then both last year and this year, we've had it going for six days. Every third square or all over Tasmania is available for a survey uh, so that people are, are spread out. That hopefully, again, it's reducing the double counting. And people can book that square uh, between them or just within one team uh, for up to three days. Uh, and a day of survey simply means uh, go there and do six 10-minute surveys in six different spots uh, around the square, separated by at least half an hour. And, yeah, that's it. So you can just, just do it in a morning uh, if you want, or you can fly down, as one team did this year, to Melaleuca, spend three days there. And, uh, in fact, they did two squares, so there's quite a lot of walking involved. And... Uh, yeah, just walk around your square doing six, 10-minute surveys. Is it preferable to maybe do six surveys over maybe 10 hours or is doing it over, like like you just said, a couple of hours? Is, is one better than the other? Well, there's a few things that we are very strict about and then there's a few things that we just kind of let people choose because uh, if we if we make too many things too complicated, we're just going to lose everyone. So that's something that we don't feel makes a huge difference. As long as we have picked winter, so as long as it's in decent daylight, uh, then then we're pretty happy with that. Why do you pick when you pick? <laughs> Why winter? Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's a terrible choice, terribly hard choice. Um, one of the things is that as a decent birdie, you might find this hard to believe, but sometimes if you're not really, if you're quite new to this, and we're really interested in attracting people who are brand new to this, if you can't quite tell the size of a bird and you're seeing it flying around, it is quite easy to confuse a swamp harrier at certain angles with a wedge-tailed eagle. And so swampies migrate uh, over the winter. So uh, we do have some, but really not nearly as many. So that was a key reason. Uh, another reason I was a bit concerned about, perhaps this was unfair, but if we have people surveying and really thinking about eagles in the height of summer, that's the height of the, the nesting period. Um, we didn't really want people to start getting fascinated by nesting eagles. They, it's, it's such an amazing thing. They really are freaked out by people staring at them when, when they're breeding. And so, yeah, we should really want to incite hundreds of people to do that. But that was a bit of an element as well. If people are, are recording instances of eagles nesting, is that the kind of information that you might try to try to withhold? Because it it's a, it, it might have a, a a really detrimental effect if people know where the eagles are trying to raise might, raise a brood. Yeah, well, first point to make is that actually it's worked out really well because quite often people are starting to think about eagle nesting, but it's at this time of the year. So they can actually go and check the nest and get the information. And that's super useful for management because it's a good thing. It is a good thing for people to know where eagles nests are so that developers and foresters and all the rest of it can avoid them. It's a, it's uh, a good thing for some people to know where the nests are, yeah. but <laughs> but definitely yeah. not, not a good thing for everybody to know where the nests are. So a few years before I started working with the Tasmanian government, they started the, the Natural Values Atlas, which is like the Atlas of Living Australia. It's uh, a great big database of where everything's been seen. And on there is a database of eagle nests. And when they started it, they absolutely were concerned about that. But actually, eventually, uh, just through trials and exploring people's attitudes, they realised that, that that wasn't a really big deal. It, it People with a lot of these things, people kind of know where they are already. So it's it's been a lot better for people to know where they are than for people not to know where they are. So far, anyway. Well, that's positive. That's really positive yeah. because I'm sure that historically the eagles in Tasmania suffered persecution in the same way that they did on the mainland. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's uh, yeah, that will completely stop, but it's vastly better. Uh, that's the perception, anyway. Yeah, it's within my living memory of driving through places in uh, in rural Australia seeing tens to 20 eagles strung on a fence. It was probably illegal in, in my childhood, but it was still being done. Yeah. So everyone's out there. They're, they're collecting their, their data. 
is it paper based and then do they submit their their forms back to a coordinator or is it all uh, is it is the whole process digital we try to reach absolutely everybody in the way that they like to do things we're really keen for people to use an app. We've got Proofsafe uh, have allowed us to use their app for free, which is fantastic. They've adapted it for our needs. Um, and of course, if you've got an app, then you can literally just press a wee button and you've got the location. There's another wee button, bang, you've got the time and the date. It, it, it's all very automated and it really reduces error. However, uh, some people just <laughs> really don't like apps. Uh, and a lot of people also are very accustomed to bird data, so they really like entering something on uh, on the desktop. So we are happy to to cater for whatever works for people. So we do have some people, we have quite a few people who use a paper-based uh, data sheets, and they might then enter it on the desktop, or they might literally mail us the data sheets. And some people will have a GPS, their, their most favorite um, machine. And some people will literally print out the map and they'll put dots uh, where they were and we'll work out where they were later on. Uh, this is all about including as many people as possible who are up for this sort of thing. And we have a lot of videos to get people into, into the whole process of, of what's involved uh, and recognizing the different species. But of course, there's an awful lot of people who are amazing at understanding which raptors which, but they might just get a bit irritated with using apps. How many people participated in, in the first survey and how many did you have uh, this year? Well, in the first survey, we did one of these expedition classes. So uh, Andrew Hughes and my colleague James Pay, who is, uh, he was doing his PhD at the time on wedge-tailed eagles. Uh, he had these wonderful. You you should you should have a wee chat to him because he, he's got a lot of lovely stories. He's got these amazing uh, GPS tags on wedge-tailed eagles. And Andrew and James went. Well, they did all their school visits, and then they went on these adventures to look for for the different eagles around the state. And they met loads of people who um, do things like trying to limit the impact of their industry on eagles. It, it was a great set of school messages and to Andrew's surprise Andrew who kayaks from all over the place and does all these dangerous things he, he didn't quite realize how popular this would be with schools so that was really cool <laughs> the eagles has uh, eagles have been an absolutely great way of inspiring people to get involved in citizen science and so they the schools were all doing it so the parents were all uh, interested in what was going on and we we really did pull in a lot of people we had 220 teams uh, that signed up and typically a team, so, sometimes there might be just one, but typically there's about three people. And in some cases, there were like whole classes who were doing the, the surveying in that first year. We then adjusted things a little bit. Uh, one of the things everyone really did just want to uh, survey their own particular square or their own school grounds, whatever. And we got a bit stricter after that because we just couldn't use all the data when it was super bunched together and we weren't getting people out far off. Uh, so in 2019, we had just under half of that number, but we actually had more than half of the squares that were surveyed uh, the previous year in terms of like useful squares that were all spaced out. Um, and we've increased again this year. Uh, we had 119 teams out this year. Uh, and that, that's so far, that's the data, the, the data still coming in because we were only just finished um, and we had 140 squares surveyed. So, yeah, time, times that by three, 119 teams times roughly three uh, is what we've got so far and we might have a few more coming in yet. If you were able to get every square that you wanted to survey done, how many squares would that be? Oh, damn it. I meant to look that up. It, I, I have Roughly. A I'm trying to remember if it's 200 or 400, so I, <laughs> I'll, I'll have to. You, you, I'll have to you, you can check that. Now. You can check that, and and uh, and we can we can make sure we get it right because I don't know if you listened to uh, to Claire Greenwell's episode, but she wanted a correction after she'd recorded her episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe maybe it's 400. Maybe it's 400 total. Uh, no, it can't be. No, it's 4,000 total, and it's every third it's one. Every, uh, square. Yeah, I'll have to check. Yeah. And there's probably some places in Tasmania that people pretty much can't get to unless they're going to mount a, a four-day expedition, I would think. Well, you see, Grant, that's my that's my ambition. 
It, we have a lot of really adventurous people in Tasmania. We just need to inspire them through eagles. Uh, it is a little challenging because it's May, but it is amazing what people do. And it was so wonderful seeing this team going down to Melaleuca this time. It was a real struggle because it was the first time that anybody had flown down to Melaleuca since the whole coronavirus thing. And we had to get, uh, you know, our, our parks okay for, for people to fly down uh, to this remote area at this time. It was all a bit of a palaver, but uh, yeah, we we had them. We had people going to Lake Pedda. It, it wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have boats going up the west coast as well? Uh, I've, got, I've got ambitions, but we're working on it. Well, it it would be, and 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 we've mentioned a, a couple of iconic uh, places in Tasmanian conservation history. More people in Australia need to get beyond Strawn and and get round that that. That south uh, southwest coast and the the really rugged coastline in Tasmania it's still quite difficult to do. Um, I hope that they will get a desire to explore a bit further than their uh, camper trailer will allow them to go. Not that I'm against people going anywhere in their camper trailers. It's just uh, it'd be just nice if um, if it could be. It's a conundrum though, isn't it, Claire? Because if you get more people going there, the risk of degrading the habitat and disturbing the residents becomes much larger. So it's that issue about awareness versus leaving things alone. I've always thought that nature tourism is very possible if you educate people in the right way. I think virtually all tourists will do what you ask them to do. You just have to ask them. Some people are a little bit nervous of doing that. They think they might lose clients, but they'll also lose the golden egg, won't they? Well, that's right. I think having the attitude that you would you would let your clients do anything that they wanted to do because they're your clients is it seems like lunacy. Sure, collect the eggs, not a problem. Exactly. Uh, that seems that seems loopy, um, but. Uh, <laughs> But, I, but, but I, think, I think some of these places, they're pretty remote. You're not, not going to get millions of people there, but the effort to get there can be immensely rewarding. With A couple of the, the team that went down to Melaleuca this year had never been there before. They actually got stuck down there because there were easterlies, which stopped them flying back for many more days than they were expecting. But they were raving about it afterwards. They had such a wonderful time. Took stunning photos. Well, Melaleuca is one of the places that's on on my wish list. You know, I've been to been to Strawn and, and Zeehan, but never never been able to organise to, to get further further in. So yeah, um, Tassie. Tassie's fantastic. If you if you're listening and you're in New York or if you're in Sweden or somewhere and and you've got a trip to Australia planned, please don't leave Tassie off and please don't think that you can do Tassie in three days because you can't. Yeah, just go gently across it and really enjoy it. Don't demand that uh, you have a, a track, a perfect track to every single place. Uh, come prepared to to walk gently across some challenging areas to get to some really lonely spots. Uh, but uh, to to anyone that knows their Australian birds and wants to take part in Wewa Wedgie, winter is a particularly lovely time to go uh, uninterrupted by anyone else. Claire, have you already set the dates for the next count? It's always in May, but we haven't exactly set the dates, but it'll probably be kind of a weekend in mid-May and a weekend at the end of May, which is what it was originally this year, but then we had to move the mid-May date uh, to avoid the the worst of the coronavirus restrictions, which which would have stopped us from, from covering the whole of Tassie. Well, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we don't get that again. What do you think is the most significant thing that you have found with the surveys so far? It, it's, a, it's a really slow burn, this stuff. We're trying to find out primarily at this stage simply whether the numbers are increasing or decreasing. First year, we found that people were up for doing this stuff, which was great because some of it's a little bit fiddly, uh, but we also learned a lot more about how to make it more accessible and interesting and understanding. Understandable. Second year, we we honed the, met- the the method, and people still did it, and that was super encouraging. And the statistician was really happy, and we had enough coverage across Tasmania. 
this year, we've simply repeated the whole thing and people have duly done it. And if anything, the coverage is better and the numbers are slightly up. So despite all the coronavirus complication, that's a miracle. So at this stage, a lot of it's about, yes, this works. Uh, and and that's really challenging because with citizen science, you want to give people as much information as possible back about what we found. Uh, they can see their contribution. We've got a results map so people can see where they fit into the picture. But this is the very first year where we will at least be able to compare the results from this year with the results from last year. But we will be pretty tentative. You know, we're going to have confidence intervals around our index. Well, it would be pretty shocking if they they were like significantly different. But the, the level of information that we've got at the moment is such that if the two years, between the two years, the population had changed by more than 40%, we would we would be able to detect that. Uh, so it's, it's really early days for that stuff. But we have this working method, which means that we will have a better idea about whether we're doing the right thing by our, our wedgies. We also know that we're going to have to really ramp up the information, the level of contribution, if we want to understand about um, our other species because wedgies are amazingly despite being endangered they're they're relatively detectable and so for the other species we need more of an effort to get enough numbers uh, of those to be confident about what's happening with their population my colleague james pay and his amazing um gps tagged eagles uh we also hope to to feed in information from them about their their ranges that they're covering so that we understand what what exactly does that mean? If I see an eagle, what area is that representing? So ultimately, we will be starting to hope to translate what people are seeing into actual population number. It, it's a slow it's a slow process. So the work that James is doing could be overlaid the collections that you've done so that people can maybe try and get an understanding of who the individual eagles are and where they where they're living. So is there also a, a, a suitable habitat map that you are working with that can overlay or underlay your results so that you can see where the major habitat loss is occurring and compare that year to year? Or are those kind of maps not being done? The kind of stuff that James is doing is definitely going to pick up a lot about things like habitat preferences. Our stuff is very much population level, whole population level. If we want to know like fine details about what's going on in different individual places, we actually need to really ramp up the effort. It's a fiddly business monitoring eagles. But with this amazing support that we have at the moment with the tagged eagles, then uh, we, we can get a whole lot of extra stuff, which I'm really excited about. But I'm hoping with the where where wedgie effort that you know money's going to come, money's going to go. But if we can set this thing up so that ultimately we have a website, we have a few people who are really into it that help coordinate it, and then a bunch of people who once a year are happy to go out and do the thing, that's potentially very low cost. So we can calibrate it. Uh, If we do ever have money, we can do some amazing work and calibrate whatever that finds with some really sophisticated numbers um, estimate. Uh, but the nature tracker's effort, where my wedgie will just keep ticking on year on year on year. That's the ambition. The reason I brought up vegetation and habitat was I think in Tasmania you've got a, a state owned corporation that does the forestry. Is that right? Correct, yeah. And is forestry the major threat to? the suitable habitat, or is it other forms of development? Well, I would say the main focus, the main conservation concern to do with habitat-y stuff is all about nests. And it may bend your mind a bit, but I would actually say that forestry has these really strict prescriptions and they are pretty, pretty focused on doing the right thing by eagles. They've been doing it for a really long time. Now, they may not want to continue to do that. To me, one of the wonderful things about having a project like this is that whole sort of what gets measured gets managed. We want to keep reminding them and everybody how how the eagles are doing. But up till now, the prescriptions are really tight about forestry checking where the nests are. And and it can change from year to year, you know, they'll they'll build new nests. So they have a, a practice of checking exactly where the nests are compared with where they're planning to do forestry operations. 
Now, whether there's some other um, aspects of what forestry are doing that affect things like availability of food, I'm not in a position to say. I think there's been some work done on that, but nothing has really strongly popped out. Uh, if you have a whole lot of pastures, you can actually have a whole lot of things like wallabies flourishing in them. It's not absolutely clear cut as long as they've got some solid forest available to to nest in that's well protected. Uh, potentially that particular industry um, isn't on its own the biggest threat. As I say, I mean, there's a whole pile of threats and it's at this stage, it's really hard to say which one the worst one is. We're, we're obviously really worried about uh, wind farms, which are horrendous for, for raptors. Just general infrastructure, like um, electrical infrastructure, there's a lot of collisions, uh, there's a lot of collisions with cars. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that we're doing and just people getting a little bit over keen with uh, just walking photography and drone photography, that, that's something that is an increasing concern as well. And uh, recently, so James, one of the things he was doing, James Pay, was looking at the um, impacts of rodenticide and lead. Um, that's rearing its, its head as something that might be a real worry as well. Copying it from, from all sides. That's interesting that you, <laughs> it's interesting that you mentioned um, the drone photography because drones are fast becoming a really crucial conservation tool. But from a recreational point of view, they they might become a real terror for, for a lot of wildlife. It's something I'm really concerned about. I have to say that my understanding so far is that with a small drone, it's usually the, the drone that loses out and not the eagle. Uh, but I do worry about this. And I see that a lot of photographers feel that because they really love the bird, they can't hurt it. They can't have an impact on it. And it, it of course, doesn't work like that. Yeah, that's an issue that we'll have to watch and watch carefully because anecdotal evidence is not really good evidence to make make judgments on. Claire, one thing I learned while I was watching your updates on Twitter when you were carrying out where, 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 G, was that a zero is just important as a sighting. I'm glad that came across, Grant. I was certainly banging on about it. It didn't initially occur to me why that would be important because I think we've all looked at things like bird atlases and and other distribution maps and, and apps. And, of course, the, the bird watcher within you wants to put a dot on a square, but it's really important yeah. for your purposes to know where they're not as much as where they are. And where they are leads you to what is the concentration of the numbers of where they are. Can you, can you maybe hash out a bit more why why you want the zeros? <laughs> yeah. It's taken me a long time to figure out how to explain it, but I think the simplest thing is that this is all about proportions of survey. We want to know how much effort was made to generate the number of eagles that were actually seen. Uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to compare from year to year. So with eagles in particular, if you spend long enough staring up at the sky, you're going to see an eagle pretty much anywhere in the state. So it's very difficult for us to do much with information where somebody just tells us that they've seen an eagle. It's like, well, it's no surprise you could see an eagle anywhere. But if we've got that measure of like how much effort and what proportion of that effort actually spotted an eagle, then, then we can do something with that. But this means, obviously, there's quite a lot of surveys, quite high proportion that don't see eagles and people naturally feel rather disappointed. But the whole way we, we try and present this is that, A, you're helping eagles, let the eagles be an inspiration for, for doing this. Uh, but also, you're having an amazing day out, whether you go to Melaleuca or just some little patch of the Tasmanian Midlands that you've never seen before, or some little patch that you actually know really well, but perhaps you haven't looked at in this way, or you're just monitoring it from year to year. There's lots of reasons to go out and just enjoy that little patch of Tasmania. And we've had loads of lovely landscape photos back. So I think people, we've got all these instructions, you know, take a picnic, bring some games, uh, bring the kids and, and have, you know, you don't have to do it every half an hour. You can like spread your, your surveys out all the way across the day and make a really fun day of it. And know that even if you've got a zero, you are a hero. And 
please, <laughs> those are the terrors. If people if people think, oh, that wasn't worth it and don't report it, then they could really, really bias the data. So we want to celebrate those people who might tend to feel a little bit disappointed if they're not quite aware of what they're contributing. Is I should say that Zero Heroes is actually a term invented by the British Trust for Ornithology. They, they were using it for an, an owl count, uh, and I, I thought it was wonderful. I'd heard it before, but I didn't instantly recognise where it was from. But now that you mention it was uh, was the owl count in Britain, well, yeah, I can re- I can remember seeing those tweets. Yeah, well, it's it's important if if you've been out and been active on the survey, it's really important to return the results. It's just like if you're selling sweets at school or raffle tickets or whatnot, you got to send the money in. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. I mean, I guess with the bird atlasing, it's pretty rare. If you're recording every single species, it's pretty rare to go somewhere and not see a single species. So if you're doing that kind of work, then you kind of know where your zeros are with regard to eagles because, you know, somebody's seen a, a raven or something. That's that you, you know the person was there busy doing their survey but we're reaching out to a lot of people who don't have the confidence to identify every single bird and do a a full-on bird data survey we hope that ultimately a lot of these people might be inspired to in the future but at this stage they're just focusing on raptors so they do have that feeling of oh (laughs) i didn't see anything I, i thought the way you approached it was really innovative and i really like the idea that people can can treat it as like like a family day out and and the idea of maybe booking a couple of squares and doing an intense morning here, lunchtime there, and afternoon tea uh, further down down the track, I think, is terrific. I didn't know how you were doing the booking, but I'll have to investigate the, uh, the app a bit further and get a, a better understanding of it. Claire, you've worked in some amazing places around the world. I mean, Madagascar, who's not jealous? Um, <laughs> And your focus has has often been on on mammals, but would you call yourself a birder? I'm an aspiring birder. I think birding is cool. I, I if I'm going off on a holiday, I will I will um, make a list. Uh, but I feel very very much I've got a heap to learn. I'm really enjoying learning learning it. In the course of the interviews I've done so far, I think we've worked out that there's a spectrum for being a bird nerd. Have you worked out where you place yourself on the on the spectrum? Well, it was funny at Cornell when I visited there. I, I think this has been done quite a lot, but I met one of the people who who was a birder and then turned into a social scientist and created categories of birders. And I thought, what an incredibly birder thing to do! It made me laugh. <laughs> I, I, he did categorise me, but I, I can't remember where I fitted. Oh, I don't know. I mean, well, m- maybe the questions will will, will sort that out. So you so you you're an active enthusiastic birder who's probably graduated beyond pea plates I would say but <laughs> but, but you're not yet writing the next field guide what I always do which is uh is borrowing everyone else's brains what's your field guide of choice when you're out birding mm, I wonder how this is going to go down I knew you were going to ask me this to be honest my field guide of choice I'm a very smartphone person. It's it's the Morecambe app. I, I love the fact that it's got the, the calls on it. I think because I'm originally a mammalogist, I tend to look on the ground looking for mammal scats and tracks. I just can't help myself. That's where my brain, my, my head goes. I find it very difficult to look up into trees. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> and so I'm listening. I do a lot of listening and I love I love being able to access calls. Uh, but I would say also, actually, if one was going to go to a bird book, we've actually quite newly got Angus McNabb's um, Guide to Tasmanian Wildlife, which covers it covers my attitude, which is like to cover lots of uh, different taxa, and it's it's great on birds. So so that's a lovely choice as well, just to throw another spanner in the works. Help me out with um, plugging that one because I I haven't seen that. Uh, not widely available in bookshops in Melbourne. Published by published by Forty South Publishing. Yeah, 40 south. A reference to uh, latitude and longitude. So Exactly. Marvellous, marvellous. You did hold up your smartphone for me, so we know you love the app, but when you're out, when you're out doing field work, what's the favourite piece of equipment that you take with you? We're talking birding? 
can be anything. I mean, birding focus perhaps, but I'm I'm really interested in in how people gear up when they uh, when they're heading out into into the scrub. Yeah, I mean, depends. You know, depends how much I'm prepared to carry. It is great to carry a big camera and a little camera so that I can, as as not a very good birder, I can get records of things. As I mentioned before, I'm obsessed with iNaturalist, so I'm also really interested in in little invertebrates. My my other half's obsessed with all sorts of very small invertebrates, and so I've got a lovely little Olympus tuff that's really good on on macro, and that's wonderful to throw those those on iNaturalist, even if I don't have a clue what they are. There's a lot of wonderful suggestions. If I'm in coverage, I can actually take a photo of something with my smartphone. Yeah, look, I'm going my smartphone, aren't I? My, my smartphone, I can take a photo of a plant and quite often iNaturalist will tell me what it is straight away, which is amazing. Or there'll be a few experts arguing about it on the app and I'll, I'll learn from that. Yeah, it's all optical stuff, isn't it? But uh, look, the smartphone is, if I, if I just had to have one thing, it probably would be the smartphone. Sounds like if you could, you'd have your big binoculars, your little binoculars, your scope, your little camera, your big camera, and your smartphone, and um, what else? <laughs> I must say, actually, that's probably a measure of my birdingness is I haven't actually got a scope, but all the other things, absolutely correct. And also I have a lousy sense of direction, so that's another reason that I'm very fond of my smartphone. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty great what's on them. I mean, Claire, the, the standard question I have for people – is usually where is their favourite place to go birding? Um, I think you have to say Madagascar. <laughs> I was kind of secretly thinking of a place in Madagascar when you said that. There's a lake in southern Madagascar that is not too far from the Baobab forest that apparently has some unbelievable uh, wildlife on the fringes of it and I can't remember the name of it but there's a duck that is Oh, like a lot like a lot must be well, a, yes super rare <laughs> yeah so yeah, I have not been there I must admit but I I was very well supported by kindness of the Durrell wildlife while I was there and they they have a, a major project on the on that very particular duck would Madagascar be your top place to go birding or have you got other places that you've been or that you're aspiring to go? There is a place that I went several times when I was in Madagascar. I, look, who knows if that range is still going, but there was a wonderful ranger who used to take me out looking at ground rollers and we eventually found all, all four. Actually, I believe there's five species now, but there were four, I think, to my memory at the time. And that was just a magical experience crawling through the forest looking for these things. My husband uh, worked in um, Papua New Guinea for a little time and I went out to visit him and we went to Kumul Lodge, which, I mean, that was just ridiculous. And we were feeling very, very sick of the altitude and they kept trying to get us to go out and be proper birders and we just wanted to sit in front of the bird table, which was completely covered in birds of paradise. So, I mean, in a way, that was a, like... A, Oh, an absolute winner. Um, but, yeah, I was very fond of the ground rollers. I've been really, really lucky. <laughs> I've got some nice choices. And, look, Tasmania is a wonderful place. I mean, just looking out the window this afternoon, I was watching strong-billed honey eaters and yellow throats, and they're both gorgeous, yeah. So any kids listening, being a biologist is a pretty good career option if you want to go amazing places. Yeah. <laughs> you, might, you might never have a Maserati but you might go some really amazing places. Claire, favourite bird? <laughs> uh, am I going just Australia or am I going whole world? The rules are there are no rules. Okay, cool. All right, so locally, I knew you were going to ask me this and it changes every day, but I often say the Ethan Spine Bill because I love the call and they are very pretty. I also... When I was in Madagascar, I decided that my favourite bird was a Madagascar kukul, which is like this great big, extraordinary, characterful cuckoo. It looks amazing. It sounds amazing. Is I'll there... stop there. Stop going there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is is there a bird on your on your bucket list on your on your I really must see this list? Well, actually, 
in Tassie, I haven't had, I have to admit, I haven't had a really good view of a hobby. And a, a wonderful um, contributor to Nature Trackers, among many, many other birding incredibleness, Peter Vaughan, uh, he took some really gorgeous photos of a, of a hobby catching a dragonfly and turning its head and then catching it and looking really pleased with it. He had a whole sequence and I've become a little bit obsessed. I really, really want to see. I mean, just the appearance of them and the eyes. I mean, falcons in general are pretty damn cool, aren't they? But I think I'd love to see a hobby, re- like a really good view of a hobby. Yeah. They, in, in all the photos, they always look bigger than they are. Like you, you, always, <laughs> you always expect them to be a slightly bigger bird. They, they terrify the, uh, the, the sparrows. They terrify them around here. Uh, yeah. yeah, we do. We do have a, a pair with uh, maintaining a territory around here. Don't see them a lot, but you know when they're around because the sparrows and 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 the honey eaters have just disappeared. Uh, oh, lucky you! I, yeah. I need to get out from behind my computer where I'm doing all this stupid promotion and actually start staring into the sky a bit more. The pair around here are um, when, when they're out hunting. They're they're out everywhere, but you don't see them. Uh, otherwise, we've got a, a peregrine pair around here because there's two of my neighbours have pigeons, uh, homing pigeons. So that's easy, oh. easy pickings. And yep. um, uh, one, of, one of the peregrines the other day was was taunting them. Obviously, not seriously hunting, just cruising around and making the pigeons scatter and change course. And he'd wait until they, he or she would wait until they'd reformed, and then go over and annoy them again. It was. Uh, it was good to watch. N- made no effort to actually get them. Just was just cruising around. Now you you mentioned Claire that you are maintaining a list that you keep a list. So oh, uh, just on holiday. Oh goodness, you're going to ask me questions about my list. Oh, no, 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 no. Just just about defining where you are on the uh, uh, oh, on the spectrum. Yeah, on, <laughs> on, on the spectrum. When you're out and about and you've got your cameras, is it an immersive experience or are you are you desperately looking for the for the next species? Oh no, no. I, I look at the the bird. I, I wanna find out about the bird, all its different calls, what it gets up to. I want to have a good look at the bird. So you can't tell me your your, your life list number. No. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> I think we know you're not at the far end of, of, of the spectrum. That's, that's very cool. Claire, I, I'm really glad that you, you agreed to, to jump on and have a chat. Keep us updated, please, about the progress of Where Where Wedgie and uh, if there's something I can do to help get the word out, just ask because it's one of the main reasons that I'm doing the podcast is to get the word out there about the need for people to just do something about preserving birds. Uh, Just do something. Contribute whatever you can in whatever way you can. And going out and counting is one way. And wrangling people to help with counting is another way. Whoops, and here's a great time just to drop in, interrupt the good guys, and tell you about a rumour I heard the 14th to the 16th and the 28th to the 30th of May 2021 are the dates for next year's Where Where Wedgie Count. Thank you so much, Grant. Thanks so much for asking me. I've really enjoyed it too.